I want to ask you this question. Who are you? Yeah. Is that who you are or is that just your name? It's your name. Anton, who are you? That's my name, Anton. But I'm, I would say I'm a child of God. Okay. It's cliche, isn't it? Yeah. Who are the go to one there? Okay. Do you tell yourself those things or do you know those things? I tell myself they do. <laughs> okay. I try and know it. Sometimes I don't feel it. It's good. It's true. And that's what the title of what I want to speak about this morning is Who Are You? I'd like to speak a little bit about identity, about who we actually are. And I think we obviously know when people say you're a Christian, you're a child of God, you're all of those nice things. But what do you really believe in your heart? Who's endorsing you? Whose voice are you trying to hear to tell you who you are? Because this is a passage of Scripture that I think is one of the most beautiful passages of Scripture and the most encouraging passages of Scripture. And it's from Luke chapter 3, from verse 21 to 23. Just three very simple, very short verses. And it's in the context of where... Um, John the Baptist is busy baptizing people and obviously his cousin Jesus gets baptized that same day. Mm -hmm. And um, the most amazing endorsement of God over yeah. Jesus. It says says, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And he was, as he was praying, heaven was opened. Can you imagine that? Seeing the heavens open. Mm -hmm. And the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. Imagine seeing the heavens open and the Holy Spirit visible to everyone. Yeah. Isn't it incredible? Just think about that for a moment. And then out of that, the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove and a voice came from heaven. You are my son, whom I love, and with you I am well pleased. Amen. Now, depending on how you see God, maybe God is this disciplinary person, maybe He's just this loving Father, maybe He's just this out there being that you don't know. To me, God is awesome, He's almighty, He's scary. If you had to see His face, I don't think we could make it. Yeah. He is omnipos omnip omnipotent, omnipresent, He's everywhere, yeah. He's seen all, in everything, and yet... His voice is spoken over His Son. Now close your eyes for a moment and think about those words over you. If God would really be here today, He is. But some of us think if. But I'm saying He is. And I want to know if you really truly believe, or if you're not sure, or maybe you need to know today, that you are my son, not mine, His, or daughter, whom I love, and with you am I, I am well pleased. In Jesus' case, was it because Jesus had done stuff? In our case, does he love you because we've done things? Or is it just purely because he loves you? Because there's no reason for God to love you. There is no reason. We don't know why God should love me, because I mean, I'm not a nice person. I'm not very nice to everyone all the time. I wake up in a bad mood. I sometimes fight. Okay, I often fight with my wife. What I want to say and, and make a, a point about is that God loved you before he put Jesus on the cross. He didn't love you as a result of the fact that Jesus did something good for you. And out of that, friends, you can change your life. And it's, yeah. identity is everything. When someone asks you to, to go to another nation and ask you for your passport and your ID, because that's your name that identifies you. And I think that's what's wrong with us as Christians, is that our names are identifying us. Not God's word over us, not his feelings over us, and not what he believes over yeah. us, but what we believe over ourselves. Yeah. And the problem with that is that we're getting these words of affirmation from places other than God. Now I want to say this, where are you looking for affirmation? Whose voice are you looking to hear God's, or the words, I approve of you? Because let me say this, the prodigal son, the story in Luke chapter 15, is that the prodigal son was in the presence of his father, 
asks for his inheritance and disappears and takes all of his inheritance money as well as the farm money as well as the older brother's money as well as everyone's money takes it away and goes and squanders his inheritance you know the story this passage of scripture has changed my life over the last six months to a year because i read a book uh, by tim keller called the prodigal god and it speaks very much of the older brother and his disciplined life and and to me, he was the good, the good kid, and the naughty kid was the one who ran away and squandered all the inheritance and came back, and he got a freebie, he came back again. But the truth is, friends, this is the thing about the, old, the younger brothers that he knew his identity. Believe it or not, the older brother, his identity, they were, had their identity in two different places and from two different places. Both of them knew the father, but one had his identity in the father's home, and the other had his identity in the work in the field. The older brother. When the younger brother went out to another field and he realized that he had squandered everything, these, these were his words. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. And he carries on, he goes back and... He's celebrated by his father. His father forgives him and all of these things. But the older brother stands outside there and he is totally unhappy with us because he has his identity in the work. He has, a, he has his identity outside of the father's house. He's the son who was never celebrated because he was wanting what his father could give him as well, but for very different reasons. Out of his own disciplines, out of his own identity outside of his father, he was the one who was never celebrated. Friends, I want to say this. The world is either defining who you are and defining your identity and shaping you, or God is. And let me tell you, if your identity is settled in Jesus, you can achieve great things. But you can only achieve what the voice is in your life, because you will follow that voice and you'll want the approval of that person or that thing over what God, what God's desires in your life or for your life far too often we look at those words from someone else with who this is my son whom i love and i'm well pleased it's what puts people into debt because we want to we want to have the approval of our friends we want to have the approval of our neighbors we want to have the approval of our wives so we go and buy expensive things to try and get approval. It's what gets people into jails. <laughs> because we get our identity in gangs. Or we get our identity in bad things. And so we do bad things. And it ends up... And because we wanted to do please some bad person, it puts us into jail eventually. I remember finding a bad friend in grade 10. And that set me on a bad trajectory because I wanted the approval of two boys. And I started becoming the worst I've ever been in my life. And it got me into trouble. And it, thank God, God saved me in, in matric. That friend then went on a drug binge for 17 years, of which I had to help him back, marry him and his wife, and now they are 20 years back in terms of where they could have been if they had just listened to the right voice and gone on the right trajectory. It's what gets us to marry and then divorce. If our identity is wrapped up in the uh, approval of the world. Because the world says there's better. The world says don't listen to that. Don't submit to your husband or your wife. And we listen to these voices and it, it gets us into trouble. Some of us have to be the boss. Or the center of attention. Because our identity is wrapped up in ourselves. We take drugs or alcohol. To get a personality because our identity in, inside of us, what is that person going to think of me? What will they think of me if I don't take this? What will they do if I don't engage in this activity? What, if, what will they say if I've never slept with somebody before? You know, all of these words, these things start determining and start shaping our behavior, and eventually we find ourselves very far from God. And let me say this when you're getting your identity from other things it limits your potential because in God supernatural things happen in those words when God approved of Jesus 
supernatural things happened. But straight after that, he was led into temptation and he was tested in his identity. He was, he was, he was tempted and tested in the area of provision, promotion and protection. The three things that we run after in people and their endorsement for promotion. So we suck up to our boss or we work harder and leave our family at home. For provision, we make all sorts of plans other than trusting in God with our finances. Putting finances where God wants us to. And we start running after hustling that 15th job and that, that 12, 15 hour day. And we try and, we try and get, get our finances from ourselves. And, and that doesn't work because it's like holes in our pockets. So I want to encourage you that we look in the right place. Amen. Whose voice is the loudest in your life right now? When you close your eyes or when you go to, into a meeting and there's new people over there, how do you interact with people? How do, you, how do you respond when you meet new people or you go to a new church or you start a new job? Let me tell you, I've been observing and there's, I believe there's many different types of ways that you deal with people, new people. But I've noticed a, a little bit of a trend. I've noticed how some people act in front of new people. So there's... I'm just mentioning three different types of ways that we interact with new people and uh, new environments, etc. And it normally comes out of an insecurity. We act out of insecurity yeah. and we try and be a certain way, but it's not really us. Because our identity is wrapped up in what will they think? How many times do you, when you go into a meeting do you think, what is that person going to say? Am I good enough? Am I good enough to play this instrument? Am I this? Am I that? So it's this question of identity. That's what Satan tries to do with Jesus. Just after he's endorsed, the heavens are open, the Holy Spirit fills him, everything's amazing. He gets sent straight into the wilderness and that's where he's tempted and tested. When there's no Holy Spirit, it seems, when there's no God in sight, no affirmation of people clapping and cheering. But when you meet people for the first time, you get, this is the first type of person, the dog. The person is just ugly to everyone in that meeting. And everyone else needs to try and get their uh, approval. Have you noticed that? The person who's ugly to everyone in the meeting is just that ugly guy. And you're like, ooh, ooh I'm a bit nervous of that guy. Let's try and be nice to him. Because he's insecure of, who he th of what he thinks of himself. The other is the nice guy. Nice to everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Are you Are you amazing? You're just amazing. Sucker. So that he can get the approval of everyone. Oh, I better be nice to everyone. So they'll all like me tomorrow. How do you live up to that forever? When you haven't had sleep for three days and you meet that person and all of a sudden you're ugly and they're like, oh, but you were the nice guy. What happened? Where's the nice guy? Or where's the nice girl gone? What about the aloof loner who doesn't like to talk to anyone? Who sits in the corner and doesn't talk to anyone. All of it, you could say... Is because of their personality. True. Could be just that one person's more aggressive in nature. The other person's just a friendly type of person. The other person's just a standoff type of person. But let me say this. If you're acting like that in front of people. And it's slightly different to who you know you are. Because of what you feel they might think of you. Then you've got an identity crisis. Yeah. You've got an issue. That you haven't settled the fact. That God has endorsed you. You cannot please man. And I want to say this as well, and it hit me, someone spoke to me about this just the other day, is that you cannot please God either. You cannot please Him. You cannot do enough. You cannot get up and not kick the dog and be nice and not swear and whatever. It's going to do nothing in terms of His endorsement over your life. Nothing. Nothing. Because in Christ, His wrath was settled the very son that he loved, he put on the cross for you. The son that he endorsed, that he loved so much, he put on the cross for you. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Could we live a life that starts and ends with God's same words over us? Yeah, we can. And it purely comes through settling and surrendering our hearts to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Because Jesus only could satisfy God's pleasing needs. 
Jesus only was the one who had to please God. Had to, in every way. He was the only one who could pass the test. and the only one who ever could pass that test, but he did. Say, thank you, Jesus, that he did. Yeah. Say it with me. Thank you, Jesus, that you passed. Thank you. Imagine your hope, everyone's hope is on you passing a law exam tomorrow that you haven't studied. That's a whole lot of prayer going into that one. You've got to remember everything. Reams of paper. All the laws and all of the clauses and all sorts of things. You've got no chance. You've got a snowball's hope in hell. But he did. He passed with flying colors. And those same words, friends, are the ones that God endorses over you and I. Again, so there's two times that, that Jesus was endorsed. Do you know that? Do you know that both times he was endorsed, he was tested too? When God endorses you as a son, when you walk up here and you give your life to Jesus, hallelujah, the moment comes and he endorses you and your identity changes, you are going to be tested, I promise you, till the day you die. But you are going to be tested anyway in your identity in, on earth. Mm. Satan wants to test your identity whether you're getting it from somebody else or from Jesus himself. That's right. He's, you're going to be tested. This life comes with hardship, whether you're in Christ or whether you're in the world. Amen? Yeah. Doesn't it? Yeah. Even if you're not in Christ, people still say, who are you? And we say, oh, I don't believe you. Oh, you're just that. You're just funny. You know, you're just this. You know, Greg said once, I'm the sum total of everyone else's opinions. And, you know, he says that tongue in cheek. But generally, that's what we are. If you don't solidify and cement your identity in Christ. And let me tell you, it's an ongoing battle for you to remember and to remain in your own understanding that, that you are enough in God. That what He did is enough for you, through you, and in you. You never have to do another thing to please God. But there's many things, I there, sir. There's many things that can help us to remain remembering the fact that he's endorsed you. The second time that he was endorsed is from Luke chapter 9 verse 35. It is God, Moses and Elijah and Jesus and they're talking and the disciples think this is awesome. We're going to build a booth and this is good. We're going to make homes for you here. This is pleasing. We're just going to live here and we're going to be the elite five or six. We're going to be the group. We're going to be the head boys of everything in the world. So that was out of his own selfish ambition. He's talking a lot of nonsense. And that's when God cements it again and solidifies the fact. They say that at the moment of uh, Jesus' baptism, that was his coronation or that was his anointing as king. And he gets tested the same as David. He gets anointed with oil and after that, he has to run away from Saul and all sorts of crazy things before he eventually does become king. Remember that? Yeah. So when you're endorsed by heaven, when you're endorsed by God, you're going to be tested by the world. When you're not endorsed by God, you're going to be tested by the world. So either way, you're going to be tested. Amen? We settle that? Yeah. Yeah. You're going to have hardship in this life, whether you love Jesus or not. It's just going to be different. I'd rather have hardship knowing I've got backup. Mm. That I've got Jesus as my backup. It's like when you go to a dark place and you go to a, a dodgy area, you really do feel a little bit safer if you've got a gun, right? Yeah. Just a little bit. Because you know that you've got a chance. Yeah. But without, with any, without anything, you're thinking, oh, I just hope I learned from Bruce Lee how to kick properly and how to fight. <laughs> and, you know, do something to, to at least beat somebody. But... I'd rather go through life with the hardships that we have, having cemented the fact that God has endorsed you, He's protecting you, He's promoting, He's looking after you. That's what we have in Christ. It says here in verse 34, while, while Peter was babbling off and all of these things and what he should do, God silences the whole lot of them. And He says, it says here, while He was saying this, a cloud came down and overshadowed them, and they were fearful as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son. Hear him. God's voice again endorses Jesus. I want to say this. We need the endorsement of God daily in our lives. We need to be reminded, friends, or otherwise 
it is so quick for the world's voice to start taking over. Amen. We need to remain in Christ. Not to say that His identity changes in you, but it's the way you perceive yourself that determines who you listen to and eventually act like. So we can say, of course, God would, I, would definitely endorse His only Son. Of course He would. we like the adopted stepkids. Am I right? So we, we often think, but Jesus was everything. I'm not, I'm not that son, that perfect son that never did anything wrong. I'm the other son. I'm the naughty one. I'm the last born, maybe. I'm the, I'm the forgotten child. I want to read this to you. One of the most famous passages of all of the Bible, John 3 verse 16, disproves what we believe about ourselves. It changes everything. Because he's one and only son, the son that he endorsed, the one that he was the only person that he ever came down in the clouds to and endorsed twice, was the very one that he put on the cross, killed him for you. God was willing to allow his own son to die for our selfishness, our failures, and all of these things. What we believe of ourselves because he loved you before creation. He loved you from the foundations of the earth and before. He knew you. He loved you. He knew he was going to form you. He fashioned you perfectly. He did all of those things because he loved you. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have what? Eternal life. Too many times I hear now, Lord, my will be done, not yours. We, we save our children because we don't want to expose them to the things of the church or the world or whatever it is. We preserve our own kids at the expense of God's kingdom. Yeah. We don't do that, friends. We should be willing to sacrifice whatever it is for the sake of Jesus because what you give to Him, He'll make much better. Yes. No such thing as pastors, kids, friends. You have a privilege of laying a life down for Jesus. Mm. You're not. We're in Christ and it's a privilege to be a sacrificial lamb. Let God so use us to say, let me be the one to be sacrificed. Let my time be sacrificed. Let my money be sacrificed. Let my will be sacrificed for Jesus' will. Yeah. That's what will grow this church, friends. Is your settled identity in Jesus and the fact that we are the best in Christ Jesus just because of him. And I can invite all of my friends to this because I know that identity is settled in this place. Amen. Truly secure people yes. attract other people. Not people, oh, I don't know what you think of me. I'm trying as a Christian. Hope you like me. Doesn't work. Because then they think, oh, I want to follow that. That's a leader. Hmm. No, I'd rather follow someone. At least he's bad and he knows he's bad and he's, he's good at being bad. At least I can follow that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Friends, how many secure Christians do we really find? How do we learn from Jesus? How do we change this? We know we are identified in Christ. Maybe here today you're still deciding whether you are endorsed by God, but you've got to give your life to Jesus to get his endorsement. So that's settled. We'll get to that. But this is how Jesus' example of what he did and how he remained secure in the sense of his identity. Yes, he was God. So let's take that away. So he knew that he always would be. But what about the human side? What did he do in the human side? To make it easier. Number one, he had regular, he spent regular time in prayer. John 5, from verse 15 to 16, it says this. Yet the news about him spread all the more, so that the crowds of people came to hear him and he to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Yeah. There's six reasons that Jesus went and prayed in solitude to prepare for a major task. Luke 4. Verse 1 to 2, 14 to 15. After Jesus was baptized, he spent 40 days preparing in the wilderness. After this, he was tempted by Satan and began his public ministry. The second one was to recharge after hard work. Mark 6 from verse 30 to 32. Jesus sent the 12 disciples out to do ministry. When they returned, he encouraged them to separate from the people they were following, who were following them to rest. To work through grief, Matthew 14, verse 1 to 13, when his cousin was beheaded. Before making an important decision, Luke 6, verse 12 to 13, early in his ministry, he spent the whole night alone in prayer when he went to go and find his disciples. 
pray, pray, pray. So you get the point. The second one, the second thing that will help us remain secure in our identity and to help us, because friends, we need to work on this every day of our lives. We need to work on our self-image. We need to work on who am I? Who am I really? The second thing that helps is Jesus never put his trust in man. Never put your trust in the words of somebody else because they will change their voice tomorrow because they're human. Do not put your trust in man. It says over here in John 2 verse 23, Now while he was in Jerusalem, the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. That was the word pisteo, which means to commit, to put his trust with. He never put his trust with man. Don't put your trust in man, with man, in the government, in someone else. You know, I'm not saying that you shouldn't obey your leaders, but don't put your trust in them because you're going to fall short, they're going to fall short, and you're going to be disillusioned and you're going to be listening to another voice. Amen? Okay, the third one is this. Jesus was sold out to his Father's will. He was sold out to his Father's will. Like I said earlier, in Luke 22 verse 42, he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he says, Your Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Because he knew he was going to be hung on a cross and he was going to suffer. He didn't want to. He didn't want to suffer the wrath of God. He didn't want to suffer the pain. But he says this. Take this cup from me, yet not my will be done, but yours be done. Always, always let God have the final say in your life. Let him determine what he wants to do with you. Because if it's not, friends, then you God in your life and Jesus has to fit in with your plans. Too many of us have groomed a life of my will, not your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Friends, it is your will be done on earth as it is in heaven and let me be the sacrificial lamb. We've not learned that the need to be willing to serve as Jesus to the community and that means it's going to cost. Expect the tests. Woohoo! Say amen to that one. Yay! Fantastic. Woo! Tests are coming. Oh no. I hate the tests. I still hate tests. I hate them. Yeah. Because you have to learn and it takes effort and it's hard. Over here, Jesus was tested in both cases. After his baptism, he was tempted for 40 days. Satan came and tested him. After the second mountaintop experience, he was crucified after that. Mm. Both times he was endorsed, both times he was tested, but both times he was triumphant. Friends. There's triumphant victory waiting for you when you settle your identity, when you let God's voice be His voice. But let me tell you this, this is the fifth one, is that Jesus was an expert in knowing and applying the Word of God. John 4 in the wilderness, the Beatitudes, when he speaks about the Scriptures and he talks about how to be a Christian. John 4 verse 14 to 30, while after the wilderness... He goes and reads in the synagogue. He speaks out of Isaiah 61. He speaks about himself. He puts it into context. And he says, this is fulfilled to you in your presence today. And then they they absolutely vilify him. And he says, you know what? A prophet's not accepted in his own hometown. He understood what happened to the prophets. Friends, he knew and understood scripture. He read and learned the word of God always. And that's what's going to keep you secure in your identity in him. I want to say this, that if you want to learn and to continue to grow in your identity in Christ, that the Word of God shape you and form you every day of your life. The Word of God needs to be in you, it needs to be a part of you, it needs to read into your life and it needs to, your actions need to be the Word of God, not the voices of the world. Is that okay?